Any sign up? No. Interesting. 13 per 14 participants. Let's check through them. Well, he is listed as a as an attendee. Oh, there we go. So but he's potentially sitting. I don't know that I can. Oh, there we go. That's easy enough. I just promoted him to panelist. I didn't there know I could do that. I am present and accounted for. Hi, Eric. For some reason, yeah, I think you came in a, on the regular link, not as a panelist. So, got uh, it. Adam just made you a panelist. So, here you are. And here I am. How are you doing, my friend? It's been it's been an interesting day. I can imagine. So, Susan and I ran out to get a bite to eat before uh, doing this, and Susan didn't realize the puppy had tanked up on the water bowl. Uh, and when we got home. Uh, there was a lake in his crate. Oh, no. So he had to get a bath. So we're scurrying around trying to accomplish that before getting online. And that's what I was in the midst of doing when you uh, when you call, return my call. Uh, no problem. Well, glad to have you. That was unexpected, to say the least. Yeah, yeah I can imagine. Any idea how many folks have been signed up for this? I think we had 36 registrants. Okay. That's we good. We checked a few minutes ago. And we have 17 right now online. And rising. Cool. So, Eric, I haven't been following it. How are the Blue Jackets doing? They're horrific. Are they really? They're 13, 29, and 2. Wow. <clears throat> oh, They're God. awful. No goalie or what? Um, no goalie, tons of injuries, which means that they are playing with uh, more minor leaguers than anything else. Uh, and um, they're just awful. Hmm. I... And you know I'm a hockey nut, and I have for the large part stopped paying a whole lot of attention to them. That's when you know they're not good. That's when you know they're horrible. Mm -hmm. Yeah, when we lived in Northeast Ohio, we used to take our kids a lot to see the Cle uh, Cleveland Lumberjacks play, which was a AHL team or IHL, one of the two. Um, but that was a lot of fun. We enjoyed that. And then we move over here. We've seen Hershey a couple of times and just we've kind of lost interest. Yeah, it's well, of course, the uh, the Blue Jackets AHL team is is now in playing in Cleveland and they're called the Lake Erie Monsters. Monsters, right. And I think most of their roster is playing in Columbus at the moment. Huh. Huh. Kind of sounds like Columbus's baseball team played all year in Cleveland. Yeah, that's that's a fair analogy. It's a very fair analogy. Difference is the Indians won. Yeah, this is true. With the kids. Okay, Eric, we're up to 24 people. I don't know if you can see that, so we're, we're getting there. Okay, cool. Because I wasn't admitted as a panelist, I didn't have any way to turn on uh, the microphone or or the camera. I'm like, oh, man, I hope somebody notices this. So I'm glad you did. Yeah. Yeah. And Adam found out he could add you as a panelist from here. So we're all we were all set. Yeah, I've never seen the ability to do that before. Zoom has changed a bit since the last time we did this. And I am having the hardest time trying to figure out what to do here with Facebook. I tried to get it to live stream, um, but it wasn't going through. So I restarted Facebook and now I don't have a link mm. on Zoom. So unfortunately, I'm not sure I'm going to be able to do that. Yeah, I guess worst case scenario, we'll just upload the video to uh, 
the it, history center yeah. into the round table Facebook yeah. pages. Yeah. Yeah. We can do that after the fact, but uh, yeah, unfortunately I'm not sure what to do here at this point. Uh, and I don't want to have to restart zoom. <clears throat> yeah, maybe if, Adam, if you don't mind, just put a quick message there yeah. saying having technical difficulties, we'll upload video, you know, once presentation's over or something like that, just so people aren't sitting around frustrated. If yes. there's anybody even in Facebook land watching tonight. You know, and of course, that's always the question. Yeah, don't know. You never know. Okay. My second Zoom today, I did one for the University of Massachusetts Lowell's History Department this morning, uh, which is interesting. It's, it's always a little nerve wracking when they, they come on the screen and there's classrooms of people staring at you. And there's, you know, groups of professors sitting around the professor's lounge. And they're all, you know, PhDs in history. And here's a little old me, Mr. S Mr. Scientist, who writes on the side, you know, talking to all these guys who are, you know, 40 years experience in the field. You know, I know, Adam, you can appreciate that, you know, being an academic. It's like, uh, you know, a little nerve wracking sometimes for those of us who want <laughs> Excuse me. Sorry about that. Sure, of course. Okay. Well, um, if both of you are ready, then I think we sure. can get started. I'm good. Nice to meet you, Eric, by the way. I'm Adam Benz. Nice to meet you too, Adam. Thanks for doing this for us. Absolutely. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Yeah, we're up to 28 people, which is wonderful. Uh, that's our highest number in probably four or five months. Yeah, um, way to go, Eric! You draw that crack. includes ah. that includes in person. So, um, yeah. all right, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Adam Benson. Uh, I am the assistant director of the Library and Archives at the York County History Center. Thank you for joining us for the York Civil War Roundtable. Um, we have two excellent speakers tonight who will be talking about um, their first of two volumes. Uh, if we are striking for Pennsylvania. But if you could bear with me for a few minutes, I'd like to do the obligatory upcoming events. Um, for any of you, any of you that are familiar with the uh, with the History Center, you'll know that we are constantly um, providing public programming of various kinds, um, and we are continuing to do that, even though uh, we're supposedly in winter. Although we haven't had a whole lot of winter weather, but it's it's coldish and it's very dark. So. Uh, that being said, um, upcoming, um, let's see, this is uh, two Saturdays from now on January 28th at 1030 a.m. We will be welcoming the All Vets group to the History Center. Um, please take note, usually All Vets, usually All Vets is taken, takes place a week after the roundtable, but uh, we are going to be uh, welcoming a special veteran, Carl Fiddler, who is a Korean War veteran. Um, and he will be speaking at 1030 a.m. on January 28th at the Historical Society Museum in downtown York. Uh, so please join us for that. Also on the 28th uh, from 10 till 4 p.m. Um, actually, I think I think my my times are wrong. I believe it's 10 till 3 p.m. Sorry about that. Uh, we'll be having our History Center Family Day at the Agricultural and Industrial Museum on Princess Street in York. So please join us for a day of family fun and learning. Our theme this year is superheroes. So please join us uh, where we're not only celebrating superheroes that everybody knows, but also more importantly, local York County inventors and innovators who are our superheroes locally. Uh, this program is part of the Cultural Alliance's Raise the Curtain campaign. Okay, a little bit later on February 5th, uh, Sunday, February 5th, the South Central Pennsylvania Genealogical Society will be meeting at the at uh, the Historical Society at 2.30 p.m. And uh, they will be welcoming speaker Rodney Barnett, who will be talking about African-American genealogy, strategies, tips, and resources. So uh, please join us for that. Then, um, I know I'm skipping over the, the round table, but uh, I'll be getting to that next. So on February 25th, uh, that's a Saturday. We're going to try something a little different uh, from 9 to 1 p.m. at uh, the Historical Society 
uh, building, a history center uh, museum building. We'll be welcoming the South Central Pennsylvania Genealogical Society, and they will be conducting a genealogical seminar for beginners. Learn the steps needed to delve into your family's history. Bring along your laptop or tablet and become acquainted with the resources that can be used in discovering more about yourself and your loved ones. So that's on the 25th. And two days later, on Monday evening, February 27th at 7 p.m., we'll be uh, starting off the 2023 season of our bookmarked book talk series uh, that's bookmarked. It takes place on Zoom. And his, the History Center will be talking about Eric Larson's The Splendid and the Vile. And if any of you are familiar with it, you'll know that it's a story uh, basically about Winston Churchill and his inner circle uh, going through the very first years of uh, Britain's participation in World War II. And I can tell you that I'm listening to it right now uh, as I commute to and from work. And it is an excellent book. It's very interesting. Um, so uh, please, please join us for that event on February 27th. And that's in preparation for yet another event that takes place on April 18th, which is a fundraiser for the History Center. It is um, every three years we have a distinguished speaker who uh, who comes to York to speak. And this this year we are welcoming author Eric Larson. He's written a bunch of different uh, popular histories, some about World War II, a very popular one about uh, the Columbian Exposition and uh, and a few other ones. So Eric Larson will be coming to York on April 18th, and he'll be interviewed by WITF's Scott Lamar. Uh, if you're interested in any of these events, please check out our website or get in touch with us. All right, and I know uh, it's not February. You're thinking, oh, here we go. We're going to talk about next month. Well, yeah, we're going to talk about next month because I think this will be popular talk as well. Uh, February 15th at 7 p.m. We will be meeting once again on Zoom, uh, just trying to avoid worrying about winter weather. So our next talk will be Pickett's Charge, What Was Lee Thinking? Uh, presented by uh, James A. Hessler, uh, licensed, uh, sorry, uh, licensed Battlefield Guide at Gettysburg. The doomed July 3rd, 1863 assault, popularly known as Pickett's Charge, is frequently considered to be one of General Robert E. Lee's greatest military mistakes. As a result, generations of Civil War enthusiasts have mistakenly assumed that the idea was doomed and suicidal from the outset. What was Lee thinking when he ordered this is one of the most common questions by modern visitors to the battlefield. Join historian and Gettysburg Licensed Battlefield Guide Jim Hessler as he answers this question and walks us through the strategic and tactical situation facing Lee to see how this infamously misunderstood assault came together. So certainly a question I've asked myself many times. I'm sure many of you out there feel the same way. So uh, that is next month's Civil War Roundtable. And uh, finally... Uh, an overdue introduction for tonight's speakers who will be talking about material that goes into their first volume um, of a two-volume work. Scott Mingus is an award-winning author and retired scientist and product development executive in the global pulp and paper industry. The Ohio native was part of the research team that developed the first commercially successful self-adhesive U.S. postage stamps, and he was a pioneer in barcode labels. He has written over 30 Civil War and Underground Railroad books. His biography of General William Extra Billy Smith won multiple awards, including the Dr. James I. Robinson, Robertson Jr. Literary Prize for Confederate History. He has also written numerous articles for Gettysburg Magazine and other historical journals. Scott has appeared on C-SPAN, C-SPAN 3, PCN, and other TV networks. He lives with his wife, Debbie, in York County. And he writes a blog on Civil War history of York County, which is uh, yorkblog.com forward slash cannonball. And speaking with Scott tonight is Eric J. Wittenberg, an attorney and award-winning Civil War historian. A native of southeastern PA, Wittenberg focuses on Civil War cavalry operations. Wittenberg is the author of 22 critically acclaimed books on the Civil War, several, several of which have won awards as well as more than three dozen articles published in national magazines. 
He was educated at Dickinson College and the University of Pittsburgh School of Law and is a practicing attorney. Wittenberg serves as a member of the board of Central Virginia Battlefields Trust and is board chairman of the Little Bighorn Associates. He also serves as the program coordinator of the Chambersburg Civil War Seminars and Tours. He and his wife, Susan, and their silly golden retrievers live in Columbus, Ohio. So uh, one more thing before I turn this over to our speakers. If you have any questions, please feel free to put them into the chat. I will be monitoring that very carefully. And uh, we will try to get to all the questions you may have at the end of the program. And I will turn things over. Okay, thanks. Let me, uh, actually, I'm gonna have to open my, uh, minimize this uh, and bring up my, PowerPoint, which I had up earlier and suddenly died somewhere or another. And Scott, when when we switch off, you're going to have to do advance the slides for me. Yep, I'll take care of that. I just need to get to my. Well, while Scott's there doing that, thank you for having us, uh, Adam. I appreciate the opportunity. No, you're very welcome. We appreciate it. Okay. Up on the screen now, Adam. No, not quite. <laughs> okay, let's go back down here. Uh, okay, what is going on? Let's try sharing it again. There we go. There we go. Excellent. Okay, not sure what happened there, but we're, we're live. Okay. Uh, thank you again on behalf of Eric, obviously. Uh, you know, this book's been something that I've worked on on and off for 10 years, and Eric uh, brought it to brought it home. So I, I look at him as the, the world's best closer in this case. So like an ACE relief pitcher. Uh, so we have collaborated on this. Uh, the PowerPoint talk is going to be a really sweeping overview. You obviously can't do the Gettysburg campaign justice in just 45, 50 minutes. Uh, but we'll certainly do the best that we can. Um, so let's step back and just look at the very beginning. And then I'll turn this over to Eric after uh, two or three slides. You know, the idea of coming to Pennsylvania certainly isn't new. Uh, Stonewall Jackson had advocated that in the summer of 1863, or 62, during the Valley Campaign. He actually had a Confederate congressman on his staff, uh, Major Alexander Bodeler, and he told him, give me 36,000 men and I'll take the war to the banks of the Susquehanna River. And that was kind of a Jackson theme for some time that let's take the war to the heart of the Yankees. You know, why do the Yankees have to fight here in Virginia? Let's take it to them. And obviously Lee paid attention because his first attempt to invade the North is stymied, of course, in September 17, 1862, at the Battle of Antietam. All winter long, Lee makes preparations to, at least in the back of his mind, that if we are going to go to Pennsylvania again, how are we going to do that? He sent teams of spies uh, into Pennsylvania in uh, the late winter, early spring of 1863, and they're starting to create maps and things like that to get ready for a potential invasion in the summer. So why did Lee want to come here? You know, like Jim Hessler's asking about why did Lee, what was Lee thinking? What was Lee and the War Department thinking in this case? Um, they wanna draw the enemy out of Virginia. They've been fighting in Virginia for 18 months. Food supplies are really low. In fact, they, you study Confederate records carefully. They're actually bringing in cattle from Florida and all over the deep South uh, to try to feed the army in Northern Virginia. Uh, there's a lot of concern that you know, food supplies are gonna run out if they can't beat the Yankees in 1863. Uh, U.S. Grant, of course, is investing Vicksburg. There's a lot of concern there. And, and one part of the campaign people don't realize is the thought was they would actually draw Union troops out of uh, Mississippi. Well, kind of did uh, because Ambrose Burnside's Ninth Corps was on trains heading down to Mississippi. They happened to be in Tennessee when they turned around and hot rushed it back to Cincinnati, Ohio. Uh, and eventually would start making their way uh, back towards Pennsylvania, although they would most certainly never get here. But more importantly, perhaps most important of all, is the ability to win a victory on northern soil. South Central Pennsylvania was rife with copperheads. In fact, Mannheim Township here in York County, 174 votes for John Breckinridge for President of the United States, and two votes for Abraham Lincoln. So there's a lot of Southern Democrat, pro-Confederate uh, sympathies throughout the region. And the general thought is perhaps uh, a major victory on northern soil, particularly Copperhead soil, might lead uh, the governor of Pennsylvania and the populace to try to force Abraham Lincoln to the negotiating table. 
that's in a nutshell some of the reasons why Lee thinks he's going to make it to Pennsylvania and you know what his goals are. Now the two armies are fairly evenly matched. There's about 90,000 uh, Federals, uh, 70,000 Confederates. Both Lee, of course, is and Hooker have previous experience. They've met at Chancellorsville back in early May. But that battle really creates two different dichotomies. Uh, Hooker is very cautious after the fighting at Chancellorsville. But the Confederates are now poised with the uh, I almost say, say aggressive confidence. Um, and keep in mind at this point, the Union Army has not defeated Robert E. Lee on the battlefield. Um, now Lee's hampered by Jackson being gone. He's reorganized, but he still thinks it's time to go to Pennsylvania. June 3rd, the Confederates are going to break camp. You see on this map uh, that's from our Eric's in my book uh, done by uh, Ed Alexander, uh, wonderful map maker. You can see the Confederates are starting to pull out. They're actually putting bonfires up at night because there's Union balloonists uh, during the daytime. So they're gonna leave at night. They're pitching huge bonfires to make sure that people can't see uh, what's going on. On June 4th, the more and more the Confederates are pulling out. And again, they're starting to move towards the Culpeper region with an eventual goal of getting to the Shenandoah Valley and from there moving to the North. On June 6th, uh, almost all the Confederates are out of Hamilton's Cross and Fredericksburg with the exception of Ambrose Powell Hill's Third Corps. And their job is to stay put for the next week or two and hold Joe Hooker in place uh, while the rest of the army slips into the Shenandoah Valley. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Eric who's gonna start the main dialogue now that we've got a little bit of the backstory. Thanks, Scott. So in the meantime, while the Army of Northern Virginia's infantry had begun to move away from Fredericksburg, there had already been a large concentration of Confederate cavalry uh, in Culpeper County. Uh, Jeb Stewart had massed three brigades of cavalry there, and a fourth would join them shortly. There was a, 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 a grand review of the cavalry on May 22nd and another one on June 5th. And the one on June 5th, Robert E. Lee was supposed to attend, but couldn't, so he ordered Stewart to uh, hold another review on June 8th, and uh, much to the disgust of the Confederate troopers who didn't want to have to go through that again uh, until they heard Lee was going to be there. The Grand Review was held uh, just outside of, of Culpeper on the farm of John Minor Botts, and you see the uh, John Minor Botts' farm, Auburn, uh, specifically noted on the map. Uh, Botts had won that farm uh, in a poker game from someone who was believed to be uh, mentally incompetent and who's by the name of Beckham, whose son, Robert Franklin Beckham, was now the chief of uh, horse artillery for Stewart's Corps. So they were uh, bound and determined to make life miserable for John Minor Botts. They held the review on his property, not realizing that all 12,000 men of the Army of the Potomac's Cavalry Corps were massing just on the other side of the Rappahannock River along with 3,000 infantry. And on the morning of June 9, 1863, in two wings, <clears throat> excuse me, with John Buford's Cavalry Division and a select brigade of 1,500 infantry, uh, they crossed at Beverly's Ford, while David Gregg and Alfred Duffier's divisions, along with a, a brigade of infantry under David Russell, crossed at Kelly's Ford. And, and the original plan was that Buford's division and Gregg's division would meet somewhere around Brandy Station with the intention on moving on Confederate cavalry that was believed to be in Culpeper. And instead, the Confederate cavalry was just across the river. So Buford's men will have a, a pretty significant encounter. To, it will cause the death of one of Buford's brigade commanders, uh, Benjamin Franklin Davis of the 8th New York, a cousin of Jefferson Davis. And Buford's command will fight for 14 hours that day. Uh, Greg's brigade, or excuse me, Greg's brigades will not arrive on the field till 11 o'clock in the morning after Buford's guys have been going at it for over six hours alone. Uh, there will be mounted charges and counter charges at a place called Fleetwood Hill, uh, which you don't see necessarily depicted on the, the map. There we there go. You. Thank you, Scott. And uh, there will be two major attacks by the Union Cavalry, both of which will end up being repulsed by the Confederate cavalry on Fleetwood Hill, right by the Miller House, which, which you see uh, where the cross sabers are. And uh, 
after 14 hours, the Union cavalry breaks off and withdraws <clears throat> after Alfred Pleasanton, the Union Cavalry Corps commander, uh, issues orders for Buford to break off and withdraw after the repulse of Gregg. So not much was accomplished that day, certainly not uh, the fulfillment of Hooker's orders to Pleasanton, which were to destroy or disperse the great concentration of Confederate cavalry in Culpeper County. Uh, Pleasanton will lie and claim that he captured uh, Stewart's field desk and the orders for the invasion of Pennsylvania, but that never happened. Uh, there were about a thousand casualties on the Union side and, and a, a more on the Confederate. And uh, it was the first major bloodletting uh, on a battlefield of a purely cavalry battle. And it was really uh, at this point was where the Confederates realized that the worm had turned and that it was no longer going to have its way with the Union cavalry anytime it met. Next slide, please. So in the meantime, there are major issues that have to be overcome by the commander of the Army of the Potomac. And I don't just mean Hooker when I say that, which is why I'm referring to the commander. There are orders that are in place that cannot be violated at any time by any Union Army commander of the Army of the Potomac. And that is, at no time can the Army of the Potomac not be interposed between Lee's army and Baltimore and Washington. He has to, the commander has to protect the national capital in Baltimore. So this certainly limits the ability to maneuver, it limits the ability to take on the other side. And this is something that's going to be a problem uh, that is going to put the Army of the Potomac on the reactive rather than proactive side. In the meantime, uh, General Darius Couch, the former commander of the Second Corps of the Army of uh, the Potomac, who resigned in disgust uh, after the Battle of Chancellorsville, has now been put in command of a newly formed uh, district called the, the, uh, the Department of the Susquehanna, which was going to be based in, the, in uh, Harrisburg, which is, of course, the capital of uh, of Pennsylvania. He's to buy time, but when he first takes command of this newly formed district, he's got a grand total of 250 men from the Veteran Reserve Corps, typically wounded or invalids, to defend the Susquehanna River in the central, central Pennsylvania. So there is going to be a call that will go out for emergency troops from New York and Pennsylvania, and before long there will be over 20,000 of them, Problem is these soldiers are, for the most part, worthless. They have no training. They have no experience. Uh, they're certainly not going to stand and fight in the face of, of Robert E. Lee's veterans, but their, their bodies, and I suppose they could be cannon fodder. But this is a major problem for the Union side. So we've got this two-pronged issue. Next slide. On the 12th of June, after Brandy Station, uh, Ewell's Corps marches into the Shenandoah Valley. <clears throat> excuse me, it is headed first for Port Front Royal, and then from Front Royal, it's going to head to Winchester. There are 8,500 Union soldiers in Winchester under command of Major General Robert Houston Milroy. Uh, Milroy is actually given very specific orders to evacuate his troops from Winchester, but he has spent the winter building fortifications, and he is actually convinced himself that these fortifications will hold against the Confederates. Now, the fact that Winchester changed hands over 70 times during the course of the war should give you some idea that it's a place that can't be defended, and somehow Milroy had persuaded himself that it could be. So instead of doing this, the smart thing and evacuating when he realized how large of a Confederate force was in front of him, he doubled down, occupied his entrenchments, and waited for the Confederates to come. And I don't have to tell you what the results of the Second Battle of Winchester were. They're exactly what you would expect in a, a three-day fight that's uh, disjointed. It's not its phases. The first day is uh, largely cavalry battle. The second day is the uh, breaking of the Union line to the south of town in, in Kernstown. And then finally, the, the later that day, the assault on the main Confederate or Union position to the north of town. Uh, leading Milroy that night to <clears throat> decide to try and escape. Uh, and instead, uh, Yule, who had anticipated this, sent an entire division 
uh, under uh, General Johnson uh, to try and interdict the, the route of escape, and it's a real debacle. Roughly half of Milroy's command is captured. The other half escapes either to, by making it to Harbor's Ferry or all the way to Everett, Pennsylvania, which was then known as Bloody Run. Uh, Milroy is humiliated. He's ultimately uh, faces a, a, a court of inquiry to determine whether or not he should be court-martialed. He's relieved of command. It's a debacle of epic proportions for the Union. Same time. Yeah, let me just inter interject, Eric, one comment before I switch the slides. For those of you who are on board from here in York County, uh, this is the baptism of fire for the 87th Pennsylvania, which was the regiment raised entirely in York and Adams counties. Um, three companies from Adams County, I believe, and the rest were from here. So this uh, Battle of Winchester was actually Eric's and my first collaboration on a book. Um, and so if anybody's interested in more details than that, certainly you can uh, hook, hook up with either of us later. But I wanted to at least mention there is some very strong York County connections to this part of the Gettysburg campaign. Thank you, Scott. And uh, the other thing I'll mention is, is that this was uh, Ewell's first combat uh, after being put in command of the Second Corps the, of the Army of Northern Virginia, after being grievously wounded uh, at Groveton during the opening phases of the Second Battle of, of Bull Run in August of 1862. And his conduct of his troops and of the, the movement on Milroy is brilliant. And it leaves uh, probably unrealistic expectations that there would be no no transition at all, that uh, Ewell was the second coming of Stonewall Jackson, and that will not prove to be the case. So after the fall of Winchester, as you can see from uh, the slide, Lincoln will call out 100,000 militia, and these are the men who will ultimately be sent to guard Pennsylvania large contingent of emergency troops from New York State, a smaller contingent from Pennsylvania. And it is, of course, a great irony that Pennsylvania's capital was going to be defended primarily by New Yorkers. Next slide. And here is uh, some discussion of those emergency militia men. You see that there were seven regiments that were hastily organized and trained at Camp Curtin. And when I say trained, I mean the most fundamental rudimentary training possible. Here's how you march. Here's how you load your gun. And not much more than that. Uh, there was the 20th, uh, the 20th Pennsylvania uh, volunteer militia was sent to York County. The 26th was sent to Gettysburg. The 27th was sent to guard the uh, large covered bridge across the Susquehanna River connecting Wrightsville and Columbia. And the rest will stay at what it will become known as uh, Fort Couch and uh, later there's also a second fortress that's developed in the area of Camp Hill, where they'll guard Harrisburg uh, from the west bank of the river, uh, along with these troops in the, the New York National Guard that I mentioned. Next slide. So there's going to be two forts built, and you can see behind the uh, the image there, the one of the remnants of what's left of Fort Couch uh, up on, in Camp Hill. You, Local citizens and many freed blacks were put to work digging these fortifications and uh, a piece of Fort Couch remains and you can go visit it. It is a small park that is uh, maintained by a local garden club in the area. Uh, it is uh, an interesting thing to see because it's not a terribly defensible position. It was not a, a terribly well chosen spot to build this which demonstrates the fact that we don't have professionals choosing military positions in an emergency situation. Next slide. So by the 22nd of June, Confederate infantry uh, had invaded central Pennsylvania and uh, led by a force of cavalry commanded by a fellow named uh, Brigadier General Albert Gallatin Jenkins, a largely mounted infantry, uh, Ewell's Corps will enter Pennsylvania in two columns, two divisions under uh, Edward Allegheny Johnson and Robert Rhodes will advance uh, via Chambersburg, and they will then eventually go from Chambersburg to Shippensburg to Carlisle and all the way up to Camp Hill, while the other column, Jubal Early's division, will advance via Greenwood and ultimately to Cashtown 
and then to Gettysburg and from Gettysburg on to York and to the Susquehanna River. So you see these Pennsylvania militia forces that are being sent out. There are, are these incredibly green young men who are well-intentioned, but over tremendously overmatched, uh, having to contend with nearly 20,000 veteran Confederate troops. Next slide. So Lee has given orders to Robert Richard Ewell on the 22nd of June that if he has the opportunity to capture Harrisburg, to go ahead and do so. And that's going to be the objective of the Second Corps of the Army of Northern Virginia. Uh, you folks live in York. You're, you're familiar with the fact that the Susquehanna River is quite wide uh, just outside of Harrisburg. It's not deep, but it's very wide. Uh, there were only two bridges uh, around Harrisburg, plus the Great Covered Bridge at Columbia. So if the Confederates were going to cross, they were going to have to pontoon, or they were going to have to find fords and wade their way across. Uh, and coming from the, the south and west, uh, as the main body of Ewell's Corps was, they were going to have to make their way through Camp Hill if they were going to be able to invest Harrisburg. In the meantime, Early decided he was going to see if he could get across the Susquehanna River uh, via the Great Covered Bridge at Columbia, enter Lancaster County, and come on Harrisburg from the south. So this is a legitimate threat, and it is creating waves of panic through the north, and in particular through Pennsylvania. You have troops manning defenses in Philadelphia. You have troops manning defenses in, in Pittsburgh, because nobody knows where the Confederates are going to go. Next slide, please. So here is a, a brief look at those Susquehanna River defenses. <coughs> you, you see the couple of railroads that, that ran through the area, <coughs> including the Cumberland Valley Railroad, which is going to, uh, which is one of the bridges across the Susquehanna River at Harrisburg. And uh, you, of course, see the defenses at Wrightsville and the defenses in Camp Hill. They're also going to have to defend Hanover Junction simply because it is a critical place uh, for supply. And there simply are not sufficient forces for the Union to be able to defend these positions properly, and certainly not these green troops. Next slide. Yeah, and if I could just add, Eric, before yeah, we sure. leave the slide. The other star that's on there is a York Haven, for those of you, again, on our audience that are from here in York County. Uh, the reason York uh, Haven is protected by part of the 20th Pennsylvania Volunteer Militia is that the two reasons. One is that's the back door to the Middletown Ferry, which was one of the largest ferry operations on the Susquehanna River at that point in time. And two, the only really viable ford on this part of the Susquehanna River was between York Haven and Bainbridge. Uh, had a small island in the middle of the river in between, and it was, it was fordable in most, most summer days. However, it had been raining heavily, and... Uh, that ford was well underwater, but they still wanted to protect it uh, as they figured, and correctly, they figured that the Confederates would indeed come to York Haven. And as we in York County know, the 17th Virginia Cavalry indeed came to York Haven looking for that crossing. So those are the five spots where the Yankees are gonna try to defend. So this is the uh, Cumberland Valley Railroad Bridge, the great covered bridge across the, the Susquehanna uh, connecting Wrightsville on the right side of the, the image uh, to Columbia on the left side of the Eric, image. This is, this is Camelback. This is Harrisburg. Oh, I'm sorry. It's Camelback. You're right. I'm sorry. So this is outside of Harrisburg. And there, in fact, I, and I should have noticed that, is the, the other uh, railroad bridge to the south of it. So this is the, uh, the main route that the Confederates would hope to take in order to enter and capture Harrisburg. Difficult to defend. And there is the Wrightsville-Columbia Bridge the longest covered bridge in North America, was it not, Scott? Yes, correct. It was at that point. So and it's second longest covered bridge ever built on earth, the longest being its predecessor that was 500 yards upstream that was destroyed in ice in 1832, which actually was about 75 or 80 feet longer. So Ewell's plan, again, was to divide his, his force. Uh, Rhodes and Johnson to march through the Cumberland Valley via Carlisle to threaten Harrisburg uh, with Jenkins Cavalry out in front and Early's division to go through Gettysburg to York uh, with a portion of Jenkins Cavalry with him escorting him. Next slide. So on the 26th of June, 
you have this two pro two pronged approach being put into effect. You see that the uh, main body of Ewell command, the two divisions of Rhodes and uh, Johnson, are headed in the direction of Shippensburg and on to Carlisle. In the meantime, Early's command passes through Cashtown and then on to Gettysburg, where it ends up having a skirmish with some of these Pennsylvania militia troops and a, a member of uh, Captain Bell's uh, Adams County Cavalry by the name of George Washington Sando ends up being the first uh, Yankee trooper uh, killed north of the uh, Mason-Dixon line. Early crosses South Mountain into Adams County. He burns Thaddeus Stevens' Caledonia Iron Works. Uh, the only thing that survived, as, as you can see there, is the stone blacksmith shop. Uh, Early was uh, really seriously offended by the uh, policies of the radical Republicans, of which Stevens is one of the, the leaders, and decided to uh, avenge things. So after burning the ironworks, they will advance on Gettysburg on two different routes, uh, the cavalry and Early coming from Mummasburg and uh, Gordon's infantry and White's cavalry advancing from Cashtown. And if Scott would go back for just a minute, you'll see that on the map that was the previous slide. So you see that right there. Okay, go ahead, Scott. Thank you. And here we have that advance. Uh, Scott, I'm going to have you talk about this since this is the subject of your book and you you really are the authority on it. So if you want to sure. go ahead. Well, and... Thank you. I appreciate it. But yeah, fairly quickly, I've been raining on uh, June uh, 26 overnight, 1.3 inches of rain had fallen. And so these Confederate columns are marching through mud soaked back roads, particularly the uh, troops under Jubal Early. Uh, they're fronted by the 17th Virginia Cavalry and they're looking to basically um, move around Gettysburg and try to trap this militia force that Eric mentioned that had been reported to be in Gettysburg. Middle of that, he was gonna have John Gordon and Elijah White's uh, 35th Battalion Virginia Cavalry uh, basically hold the Yankees in place while Early slipped around the back. Well, the timing of this pincer movement gets all messed up because the turnpike being macadamized uh, drains fairly well. And so Gordon can make a lot better time than Early can. So Early is in no shape or form where he should be or where he wanted to be in position to swoop down in the back of the militia when Gordon drove them into his arms. Instead, Gordon's going to launch the attacks. Uh, he's going to drive the militia back, but there's nobody really to scoop the militia up. They're going to capture 175 of them uh, near the Whitmer farm. But the Confederates are going to march into Gettysburg in fact, this is a really nice painting by Dale Gallad. Uh, and it's a trivia question that if those of you who want to impress your friends and try to get a Coca-Cola as a bet, uh, name the first Confederate officer to enter Gettysburg during the Gettysburg campaign, uh, and it's Elijah White. Uh, so you see Elijah there in the center with his uh, black plumed hat. Uh, you know, see, uh, and you notice the mud, you know, the uh, artist who's uh, you know, Dale Gallad in this case, uh, certainly did his homework in realizing that. Uh, Gettysburg Falls, uh, two o'clock or so in the afternoon uh, on this very dreary, dull, overcast, still drizzle uh, afternoon. Uh, Jill Borley is going to come into downtown uh, here. This painting's by my neighbor and friend Bradley Schmel. Uh, you'll see Jill Borley there in front of the water trough. That's uh, Colonel William Thornton to his left in the white duster. Um, and Early is calling on David Kendallhart, uh, who was the uh, part of the town council, uh, the uh, Chief Burgess had already left with his horses to take them to safety, uh, leaving the committee, committee of safety behind, headed by David Kendallhart. Uh, Early is going to make demands on the town, um, and uh, town's not going to be able to comply with very much. While it's, you know, Gettysburg is a small town, 2,800 people or so at the time of the Civil War, uh, and they don't really have a tremendous amount of supplies. Plus, it's raining, it's getting late in the day. And Early really doesn't have the time to do what he really wants to do, and that's search the buildings thoroughly and try to find things throughout the town. Uh, but he's not going to get that. Uh, they are hauling down the U.S. flag. They're going to be putting that down. This is uh, John Gordon's Georgians and the officer in the left center of the picture on the black horse uh, with the troops is Brigadier General John Gordon from Georgia. With that, I'll turn it back to you, Eric, as we talk about the, the march now uh, east towards the river. All right. Thanks, Scott. So the Confederate infantry will occupy Carlisle 
and the campus of my alma mater, Dickinson College, on Saturday, June 27th, uh, creating a great deal of terror in, among the citizenry of Carlisle. Uh, Jenkins guys will actually advance as far as Mechanicsburg uh, before getting ready to test the defenses of Washington or of Harrisburg the next day. In the meantime, Early will press on through East Berlin and on to uh, a, a little community called Big Mount, uh, while Gordon's column will go from New Oxford and Abbottstown, uh, headed in the direction of York. Uh, some of White's men will do some skirmishing at, ha at uh, Hanover Junction with men of the 20th uh, Pennsylvania Emergency uh, Volunteer Infantry, and will rout them, uh, leaving the, the junction. Uh, and then eventually, they'll have press on toward Wrightsville, which is defended by uh, Granville Haller and the men of the 27th Pennsylvania Emergency Militia. Uh, it's worth pointing out that the commander of the infantry troops uh, defending the uh, outskirts of Harrisburg is Major General William Ferrer Smith, known as Baldy to his friends, who is a former corps commander of the Army of the Potomac, just like uh, Darius Couch is. So you have a competent officer in command of incompetent troops, which was infinitely frustrating to, to Baldy Smith. Uh, next yeah. slide. Yeah, and frustrating to Darius Couch as well, I'm sure. Oh, no doubt. So uh, the Confederates on the 28th will leave Carlisle. They will head, uh, one column will head to Dillsburg, while the uh, the bulk of Jenkins' command will make it all the way uh, to Oysters Point uh, in Camp Hill, where they will skirmish with some of the men of the 26th uh, Pennsylvania Emergency Infantry. Uh, that's as far as they will make it is to Oyster Point. That's the uh, sort of the the farthest advance, although a column of Confederate cavalry will, will go to a place called Starrett's Gap, which is north of Mechanicsburg, and that will be the farthest northern point of the Confederate invasion of Pennsylvania. In the meantime, the rest of the uh, Confederate command under Early's uh, troops will end up uh, burning the railroad bridges. Uh, and in the meantime, uh, Gordon's troops will make, march all the way through York and head on to Wrightsville. In the meantime, and then after they pass through York, early with the rest of the command will occupy York. Uh, and uh, they will have some entertainment along the way. It seems that some of the local citizenry have been convinced that, that if they pay, uh, they can get a certain... Uh, sign, I guess, is the best way to describe it, and be told peace, peace, to say peace, peace, and that that was a, a way that they would avoid being harassed by the Confederates who were highly amused by these bizarre gestures that were being made, and by the uh, the local citizenry saying peace, peace at them. They didn't understand what was going on until somebody actually explained it to them, and they were highly amused. Scott, why don't you go ahead and talk about Gordon's entry into York? Sure, if you don't mind. Uh John Gordon's infantry arrives here in York at about 10 o'clock in the morning of Sunday, June 28th. Uh, he's got about 1,800 or so infantrymen. He's also got Elijah White's uh, cavalry and one company of the 17th Virginia Cavalry that arrive in town. Uh, they actually, if you notice on this, this drawing, it's a wonderful drawing by a York artist by the name of Lewis Miller. And I use this uh, slide with the permission of the York County History Center, the partner, of course, to the York Civil War Roundtable. Uh, this is drawn by Louis Miller. You'll see that I've circled uh, General Early and General Gordon. Uh, so if you go directly up from those two red circles, you'll see the two officers there uh, on horseback. Gordon, of course, and his characteristic black horse that he had captured from Milroy's men at the Second Battle of Winchester. But what's fascinating about this slide, and I corroborate this with a lot of local York County accounts that I've collected over the years, is you see the first troops to, to enter town or the Pioneer Corps. So you see these guys carrying their, their pickaxes and their shovels and things. One lady in York, seeing these guys walk into town, screams at the top of her lungs and says, oh my God, they're coming to bury us. And she faints right on the streets of York. Because again, there've been rumors all over Pennsylvania for weeks that the rebels, number one, are gonna burn a town. Number two, that they eat babies and children. Number three, that they're you know, going to kill Pennsylvania civilians. I mean, all these wild rumors have been circulating for weeks and weeks, uh, and now the rebels are here. And so the populace's very first thought is, oh my God, you know, here they are. They really are gonna bury us. 
Um, what's missing in this picture is the 18 by 35 foot flagpole or flag uh, from 80 foot high flagpole that is you know, right in the middle of York Square. But what's also interesting about this is you'll see General Early talking to York City Council. Um, as they come into town, most of York City Council the night before the battle, uh, as well as the Chief Burgess had ridden 10 miles west of, Get, uh, of York on the road to Gettysburg and had formally surrendered the town. Uh, that was in response to being triggered by Arthur Briggs Parker, a uh, 26 or so uh, year old Quaker businessman, uh, Maryland native who lived in York at the time, who had ridden on his own, seeking out his old college roommate, uh, Rooney Lee, Robert E. Lee's son, uh, who had roomed with him at Alexandria uh, College or Alexandria School in Hollowell, Virginia. Uh, he had pulled the same stunt in 1862 during the Antietam campaign, and now he is here trying to do it again. Eric, I think we've lost your... Uh, Sorry, I, I had to deal with the, with the four-legged member of the family for a moment. <laughs> no problem. Yeah, did All you right. want to add anything? No, I, this is this is your area of expertise, so I'm happy. Okay, to let, let me you... just look, finish up on York just very quickly. So while Early's here in York, much like he did at Gettysburg, much like he did at Waynesboro, much like he did at Greencastle, Early is going to demand compensation uh, for from the town. Again, there's been a lot of people that are worried he's going to burn the town to the ground. And so they're going to go door to door in York. Uh, they're going to appoint uh, ward masters, if you will, a uh, small committee of men in each of York's seven wards. And they're going to go around in their particular ward and they're going to go door to door. And they're going to ask for money to be given to the Confederate Army in response to General Early's demand for $100,000 in cash. They will collect $28,610. Uh, for which a receipt is actually given and the receipt still exists. Um, but, you know, it's really a traumatic time for the <laughs> citizens of New York. And, and one of the more poignant stories that comes out of this is the fact that several mothers here in York uh, and wives notice that many of Gordon's men are carrying uh, black knapsacks with U.S. emblems on them uh, emblazoned stenciled 87th Pennsylvania. Uh, and unfortunately, one story that, that uh, has always touched me is a lady here in New York spots the name of her son stenciled on this uh, backpack and she asked the confederate where he got it and he said took it off a dead yank at Winchester and that's how this York woman learns that her son's not going to be coming back to York. Um, York technically surrenders depending whether you want to use that word or not. Uh, Louis Miller who drew this again York County History Center provided this slide uh, uses the term surrender of York you see Elijah White there again with his black plume on his hat, uh, with his black britches there in the center. Uh, John Gordon on his black horse to the right. Uh, some New York citizen, maybe Arthur Parker, I don't know, holding uh, the Confederate officers' uh, horses as they haul down this flag, symbolizing the surrender of York. With that, uh, Eric, you want to take over as they march to the river? Sure. So. After leaving York, the Confederates are going to make a, a rather rapid advance uh, on Wrightsville with the intention of, as I said, capturing that uh, covered bridge, crossing the Susquehanna, and uh, entering Lancaster County. But the, the defenders of Wrightsville will set the bridge ablaze in order to prevent precisely that from happening. And... Uh, Interestingly enough, when the Confederates arrive after driving off the Pennsylvania uh, emergency militia, and you see the uh, the battle lines there and where the skirmish took, takes place, Gordon's men will actually form a bucket brigade to prevent the houses in the town of Wrightsville from being uh, set ablaze by sparks uh, leap, leaping from the, the burning bridge. The bridge will be destroyed. It will never be rebuilt. Uh, as I'm sure all of you are aware, if you go to that place on the river today, uh, right by the John Wright restaurant, you can take a look out in the river and see the piers from the bridge. They're still there, but the bridge was never reconstructed. So this is to Jubal Early's great frustration. He really wanted to get into Lancaster County and see if he could make his way uh, to advance on Harrisburg from the south while the other two divisions of Ewell's Corps uh, were making their way from the west and uh, uh, the burning of the, the Great Covered Bridge uh, frustrated 
early and frustrated those attempts. Uh, yeah, and Eric, if I can add, if you don't mind, just no, please second. do. Uh, the picture here is Colonel Jacob Frick. Now we've talked about how inept and incompetent, uh, and inexperienced and poorly trained. Uh, Eric used those phrases, so have I. Over the years, this militia was. This is a ringer. Uh, this is the 27th Pennsylvania Volunteer Militia. Many of the officers and at least 200 of the men uh, and their commanding uh, officer, Colonel Jacob Frick, have been in the Army of the Potomac until May. Uh, this is the 129th Pennsylvania who had fought at Chancellorsville. Uh, these guys had been uh, sent back home after the term of enlistment had expired. 75% uh, of the officers uh, in this regiment, senior officers and the uh, captains, were veterans of Chancellorsville. Uh, these guys are not the typical you know, bad militia that we all think of during the Gettysburg campaign. The 27th was, you know, had a lot of those guys, there's no doubt, but they were able to hold it together because the lines are filled with veterans. They actually interspaced uh, the veteran soldiers in with the rookies. So they would heap them. And this is one case where I really think John Gordon was expecting the militia just to run across the bridge and not to hold them off long enough to actually destroy the thing. And then orderly, uh, most of these guys, so there's a little bit of panic in the 20th militia. They're gonna lose their Lieutenant Colonel and uh, several of their men, because they do panic and race off to the Henner's lands. But the 27th militia, and, and the other company I wanna mention here, you'll see in the bottom of this is the York Battalion. They're from here in York, uh, from the US Army General Hospital, which at the time of the Gettysburg campaign, 1800 beds. Um, that was in 1600 beds, sorry. That was a major hospital. A lot of these guys are veterans of Antietam who have been brought to York uh, to recover from their wounds. They're actually commanded by the surgeon of the Iron Brigade and their officers in charge of them is a member of the third Wisconsin, uh, or second Wisconsin, I mean, from the Iron Brigade. Uh, so these guys are, are bad at all. So I, I wanna leave people with the opinion that the Pennsylvania militia, you know, turn around at every minute. Uh, the 27th, at least, does a decent job. They certainly could have did it better, but they standing managed to hold in, Gordon up long enough. Standing in stark contrast to the troops signed to Camp Hill. Exactly. Um, one other quick story I'll tell again for the interest of the folks here local from York County, and that's the fact this is a diorama that exists in Wrightsville. Uh, it was built largely by the students from uh, Franklin and Marshall College and from my oldest son's uh, school he got his master's degree in history from Millersville University. Uh, so these students had come over, they spent a week in the Wrightsville area, and they did basically nothing for six days other than dig entrenchments. And so these earthworks are some of the very first entrenchments that are built during the Gettysburg campaign outside of Winchester, uh, where the entrenchments were pre-existing. Uh, but these are hastily dug in the soil, uh, and one of the interesting contrasts in this is this is limestone area. This is really easy soil to dig. And so these guys were able to put up some rather nice entrenchments. They try the same thing, by the way, the Army of Potomac at Gettysburg, only that soil was not limestone. That was more diabase uh, and clay, and they couldn't dig very deep. So there aren't many entrenchments at Gettysburg itself. But here at Wrightsville, uh, they were a massive amount of very well-constructed uh, earthworks that surrounded the town. Uh, this happens to be the replacement covered bridge that was put up uh, four years after the Civil War. It was knocked down in, in uh, September or October 1897 by a tornado. But what's important about this is the fact that this view of the second bridge pretty well simulates what the view would have been from the heights of the Civil War era bridge itself. And that area, uh, Lockhart's Meadow, where all these militiamen uh, retired to after they retreated across the bridge. That's well known to many of us that cross uh, through Columbia today. It's now called Turkey Hill Experience. Uh, this is the destruction of the bridge, again, painted by my neighbor, Bradley Schmel. Uh, fairly accurate painting, uh, again, showing these militiamen retreating, retreating across the river in very good shape. Uh, Eric, I'll turn it back to you on uh, June 29th. Thank you, Scott. So. On 29th, there'll be yet another skirmish at Oysters Point in the uh, in Camp Hill, and this is rather literally uh, in the the streets of of the the community of Camp Hill at this point, between Jenkins' men and some of Baldy Smith's troops, uh, that will go on for uh, several hours. In the meantime, on the 29th, word has gotten to Robert E. Lee. 
uh, via a spy by the name of Henry Harrison, uh, that the Army of the Potomac has crossed the Potomac River, is in Maryland, and in hot pursuit of Lee's army. So Lee is going to, that day, order the concentration of the Army of Northern Virginia at Cashtown, which is about six miles to the west of Gettysburg, meaning that uh, Gordon and Early will receive orders to withdraw from the Susquehanna River and move their troops in the direction of Gettysburg. Same thing will happen with the main body of Ewell's Corps, which is why Jenkins will have to break off and withdraw from uh, his skirmishing in, in Camp Hill as the Confederate troops begin to uh, backtrack and make their way in the direction back to Carlisle and then from Carlisle to Heidlersburg, and uh, they'll take up a position a few miles north of Gettysburg on June 30th. In the meantime, Early's command on June 30th uh, will make its way in the direction of, uh, of Gettysburg, as it's supposed to do. Uh, there will be a large cavalry battle between Confederate Jeb Stewart's Confederate cavalry and Judson Kilpatrick's Union cavalry, uh, at Hanover. Early will be eight miles away from this fight at one point. He'll hear the artillery barking, will listen to it briefly, decide it's nothing of consequence, and, and instead of sending uh, some of the significant uh, portion of Confederate cavalry had with him to go find out what this noise is that's going on in his rear, he'll instead say, eh, it's not worth the bother, and move on and lose the opportunity to link up with Jeb Stewart's cavalry. So I'm not one for what ifs, but I'll give you one to think about here. Imagine that Early had instead done what he should have done, which was to go and investigate the sound of the artillery, find out that it's Stewart, link up with Stewart so that when his command approaches Gettysburg on the afternoon of July 1st and pitches into the 11th Corps, He's got Jeb Stewart's 4,100 cavalrymen leading his way. Ponder that for just a moment, because that's what should have happened. Jenkins' men will have a fairly significant skirmish on their way uh, toward Carlisle, a place called Sporting Hill. Sporting Hill is between Camp Hill and uh, and Mechanicsburg. Uh, they'll they'll have a skirmish there with some of these New York uh, militiamen. Uh, under Baldy Smith, they won't uh, hold those men off, and that's really all they needed to do. It's a rear guard action. He'll send a detachment into Mechanicsburg to occupy it, and then those troops will fall back, passing through and terrorizing the people of Carlisle once again. So you have this large force of the Second Corps that's making its way back in the direction of Gettysburg, where while the uh, Third Corps of the Army of Northern Virginia under A.P. Hill has concentrated in the area around Cashtown. So go ahead, Scott. Eric, if you don't mind, one, one sure. quick uh, comment, if you don't mind. No, of course One of your expertise, obviously, is John Buford. You want to briefly describe there on the bottom left, we see Pettigrew of Buford. You want to spend a couple I was of minutes and just talk do we about have a, that? Well, do we have another slide or is this it? No, I think the, we have one more just on July 1st. Okay. All right. I didn't realize that. So sure. Happy to. So John Buford is the commander of the first division of the Cavalry Corps of the Army of the Potomac. It's three large brigades. One of them, the Reserve Brigade, commanded by newly promoted Brigadier General Wesley Merritt, has been left behind uh, in Maryland, much to Buford's consternation. Uh, they've been left at what then was called Mechanics Town. It's today Thurmont, Maryland, uh, guarding wagon trains and supplies meaning that Buford's got to make his way into Pennsylvania without his largest and best brigade, which is the regulars of the Arm United States Army. Uh, they'll arrive in Gettysburg on the morning of June 30th. One of those brigades will uh, make its way in first. That's the brigade of Colonel William Gamble. And uh, as the head of Gamble's uh, column is entering Gettysburg, Confederate infantry of James Johnston Pettigrew's brigade of uh, Harry Heath's division of the Third Corps, spots them entering the town. Uh, they've been on an expedition in the uh, best described as a reconnaissance in force in the direction of Gettysburg looking for supplies. Uh, they will stop it on Seminary Ridge to see what the uh, what this Union force is. 
Uh, they quickly realize these are not militia troops. These are, in fact, soldiers from the Army of the Potomac. They'll stand and stare each other down for a little while, and uh, ultimately Pettigrew will withdraw. In the meantime, uh, on the way to Gettysburg that morning, Buford's troops will have skirmished with some of his troops at, at Fairfield, and, and after breaking off, Buford will make his way to Emmitsburg, and then from Emmitsburg, just north of the uh, Mason-Dixon line to the Moritz Tavern, where he will stop and consult with Major General John Fulton Reynolds, the commander of the, the left wing of the Army of the Potomac. He's going to tell Reynolds that there is a very significant force of Confederate infantry uh, in the Cashtown area uh, before leaving and heading to Gettysburg. Uh, after this short face-off with the, with the Confederate infantry, uh, Buford's going to send out scouts who will enable him to report some terribly accurate intelligence back to uh, both Reynolds and uh, Army of the Potomac headquarters about the dispositions of the Confederates. They will, for instance, report the presence of, of uh, Confederate infantry at Heidlersburg, uh, and uh, he will also report the presence of this Confederate infantry at Cashtown. Uh, he will then spot the, the terrain features that make up the Gettysburg battlefield and decide that uh, given that the threat is coming from the West, he's going to defend it from the West and will establish a seven mile long line of pickets uh, intended to serve as an early warning system so that on the morning of July 1st, when the Confederate infantry begins to advance on Gettysburg, uh, they are able to uh, get the, the word out and Buford's troopers will hold to the West just long enough for first the 11th Corps or first Corps and later the 11th Corps uh, to come up to the battlefield, thereby setting the stage for and uh, conducting the first day of the Battle of Gettysburg. In the meantime, as you can see here, Judson Kilpatrick's cavalry, having left uh, Hanover, goes all the way to New Berlin or East Berlin. Uh, and you see that uh, David Gregg's cavalry division makes from Glen Rock to Hanover Junction and then on to Hanover. The 5th Corps of the Army of the Potomac uh, comes up from uh, Union Mills, just north of Westminster, Maryland, to Hanover, to McSherry's Town, headed in the direction of Gettysburg. And you've got Baldy Smith leading his emergency troops to Carlisle, uh, arriving there in time to defeat Stewart's uh, advance on, not defeat, but to def deter Stewart's advance on Carlisle. On the night of July 1st, uh, there is some shelling that created a great deal of terror in, among the citizenry of, uh, of the town. And uh, we all know what happens on July 2nd and 3rd. So yep. go ahead, Scott. No, I was just going to say, I mean, obviously, the the one key thing I think the takeaway in all this is for all those, you know, eight, nine hundred thousand people used to be a million plus that come to Gettysburg Battlefield every year. Uh, the Gettysburg campaign is far more than Pickett's Charge, Little Round Top, Devil's Den, you know, all the places the tourists come. Uh, all these little towns throughout Virginia and Maryland and Pennsylvania that are part of this campaign deserve to have their story told as well. And that's, you know, frankly, one of the reasons why Eric and I, you know, wrote volume one and volume two of If We're Striking for Pennsylvania was to kind of tell some of those stories as to what went on in some of these small villages uh, on these different places. So, and and um, in the interest of of brevity this evening, uh, we couldn't cover everything that actually yeah. happened. There were three major cavalry engagements on June 17, 19, and 21 in the Loudoun Valley of Virginia, mm -hmm. at Aldi, Middleburg, and Upperville. There was constant skirmishing uh, by Union cavalry that was uh, dogging the advance of Jenkins' men all the way up to to the outskirts of Harrisburg. There, and we couldn't even really get into the impact of this invasion in this short of a period of time on the citizenry, particularly of towns like Chambersburg and Shippensburg and Carlisle. It was, uh, it was a terrifying season for them. So uh, Scott's exactly right. You, you can't just look at the three days uh, in Gettysburg in a vacuum. You have to look at the entire campaign. Uh, we spent 900 pages covering uh, 27 days, and it's really a pretty remarkable study. And I've also written, uh, along with two other authors, a lengthy study 
of the retreat from Gettysburg. Mm -hmm. So again, you can't look at these events in a vacuum. And with that, Adam, we'll turn it back to you. Thank you, Dr. Benz. Well, thank you so much, gentlemen. Um, <clears throat> I think uh, I think you made some really interesting points, and you know, I, I I've heard Scott, I've heard you talk about um, the the surrender of York multiple times, and for some reason, I've never heard that story about the about the the pack uh, that the mother recognized. I, I don't know how I missed that story, but. Uh, do you, do you think that that's a true story? Have you seen that in multiple, uh, multiple it, places? It or, comes uh, down actually from a, a, a source back in the in the 19th century. Uh, whether okay. it's really true or not, probably, uh, because mm -hmm. it seems to be a fairly reliable source. Uh, but yeah, <laughs> there's a lot of legends here in York County as well. Yeah, there are. Absolutely. You know, um, well, being an alum of Dickinson College, I have a great interest in these events having walked those grounds for four years, you know, mm -hmm. there, there are markers around the campus at, at, in Carlisle talking about the visit of the Confederates. And uh, it, it, it's one of the things that prompted me that when Scott invited me to, to join him to finish this journey that made me say, yeah, I want to do this. And uh, it, it, it only plays up the fact that there are so many stories out there that haven't even been told. You know, we only we wrote 900 pages worth of stuff and we only really scratched the surface. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, the hardest thing was going through our mutual files and deciding what are you going to leave out? Uh, exactly. Because, you know, for, there's just so much stuff. We, I mean, honestly, I think Ted Savage was worried this thing could have been, you know, five volumes. Uh, if and we it, would have really wanted and it could out. have. It could have. When you think about how much has been written about three days at Gettysburg, uh, but you're somehow going to condense the events of months or, you know, a month and a half or whatever you choose before that period. Um, you know, it's easy to understand how you could end up with, with those kinds of tomes of material, but. Um, and, and just one other thing I'd, I'd like to point out before we, we answer any questions. This road was not blazed by us. This road was blazed by a fellow by the name of Wilbur Sturtevant Nye, who published a book in the early 1960s, uh, coming up on the centennial of, of the, the battle, called Here Come the Rebels. It's a great book. And it, it covers what we covered in 350 pages. So obviously, it doesn't have anywhere near the depth of what we've done. And what we set out to do was to pay tribute to Colonel Nye and take his work and expand on it. And if we've accomplished anything, I hope that's what we've accomplished is paying proper tribute to Colonel Nye and his contribution. Exactly. All right. Well, um, there are two there are two questions we've received. I'm sorry, we have three questions here. Uh, I'm just gonna try to do these in order. And uh, I'm looking at the Q&A, but if you'd like to send in any questions to the chat, that would be fine as well. Uh, first question is from Craig Johnson. Uh, he said his audio broke up during the discussion of the York, York Battalion at Wrightsville. Um, can you give me the name of the second Wisconsin officer who was there? Uh, actually, off the top of my head, no. It's in our book, Flames Beyond Gettysburg. I'm trying to remember the guy's name. Uh, unfortunately, that's a book I wrote in 2009. Probably should know that guy's name, but it's it's it escaped me right now. So, Craig, if you're hey. interested, if you're interested, just drop me a a, a quick email at scottmigas at yahoo.com. I'll be happy to do that. I I know exactly almost which page it's on. I just got to go do that. Uh, this question is from David Gilson uh, for Scott. Uh, is there any record of the roster of the York Battalion from the hospital? Ah, great question. Uh, I've actually looked for the roster at that point in time. Now, this predates the, cart the cartridge box, the newspaper that started getting published mm -hmm. in 1864, which, Adam, you guys obviously have yes, the York County History do. Center, a really nice collection of the, those issues. So, and they, they log in that newspaper faithfully, who's in, who's out, who's coming, who's going. Uh, but we don't have that record for 1863, so we don't know. 
And I've actually looked to see, uh, and we know the names of some of these guys, of course, uh, because they wrote or wrote about it. Uh, or if you look at some other hospital records, you can find, and, and I can piece together the names of maybe 50 to 70, but you're talking about, you know, two or 300 of that were uh, ambulatory and at least showed up at Wrightsville. Um, incidentally, and I'm not sure, Scott, that I ever mentioned this or we talked about it, but um, the um, all of the cartridge box that exists on microfilm, and I don't, I'm not sure right now that it's a complete run, but everything that we had on microfilm is on newspapers.com now. So, mm -hmm. yeah, you can read the cartridge box right there. Yeah, yeah I, I've, I've read through them almost every issue now. That's oh, great wow, news. that's great. <laughs> oh, that's great news. Yeah, if anybody's interested in the operation, the day in day out operations of a very typical and very large, in this case, ends the war, 2000 beds, uh, typical US Army hospital, the cartridge box is absolutely in, indescribable how wonderful it is. Gives you an idea. I mean, this place had its own newspaper, it had its own mm. library, uh, had its own, you know, you know, glee club. I mean, just amazing what was going on mm. here. Uh, they actually beautified the grounds, they had a grounds crew of invalids who were planting gardens and flowers and just, you know, wasn't your typical garden variety, you know, place of suffering and despair. Sure. It was uh, it's quite nice. And and a number of these soldiers liked it so much, they married women here from York County and came back and lived in York, died and their descendants still live here today. Hmm. Has there ever been, has there ever been a book published about the, about about the U.S. The hospital? Army Hospital? Funny yeah. you should ask. Yeah, hmm. uh, actually, I included a uh, a whole chapter in my, my latest book with Jim McClure that came out last. Uh, oh man, November, okay. I guess it was, but I yeah, I've actually, believe it or not, on my okay. list of things to do is a complete history of the York U.S. Army Hospital, and okay. I've, I've got all the notes. I just need to find the time now to uh, put that together, and that's my winter project next year. All right, um, and a question here from Richard Buchanan. Um, if White's cavalry left York and went directly west, why did Early not follow instead of an indirect route? Well, actually, keep in mind that Early had not been together on the march to York. He had been on northern roads. He had uh, Gordon uh, immediately to the south on U.S. Route 30 coming to York, had Elijah White further south. They just kind of shifted that a couple roads up. So now Elijah White's on U.S. Route 30, goes out to Abbottstown. Gordon is now on East Berlin Road, uh, and then uh, farther to north on Canal Road and Davidsburg Road comes Jubal Early. So all the way through, to make his column as compact as he can, he's moving them parallel as opposed to one long serial string right. of soldiers. Right. And by the way, that's if you go back all the way to what Eric was talking about early on, that's very typical strategy. When Richard Yule came into Pennsylvania, he's coming in parallel columns because you can move more men into a region much faster by using parallel roads than just one at a time, marching, you know, 15 mile long column. And that, that by the way, is one of the issues that becomes prominent during the retreat from Gettysburg because you have Robert E. Lee's 17 mile long wagon train of wounded that's going to be using the Cashtown Road all the way to Chambersburg. You can't then clog that up further uh, with infantry and with artillery and with the herds of animals that accompany an army. So you, you, we had to use a completely different route to evacuate his army, which is going through the Monterey Pass. And uh, you, you see these logistical issues really brought to bear uh, as you study this, and I'm, I'm reminded of the old cliche that uh, amateurs study tactics and professionals study logistics, and and here's a here's a good example of the reason why. Mm -hmm. um, if I may ask a question, which I'm, I'm sure can't be answered quickly, um, but I've I've always been fascinated by this idea of what happens if the Confederates had made it across the bridge into Columbia. Um, can either of you make make a brief make a brief guess or is this something Yeah, I'll that... give you one real quick and then I'll turn it over to Eric. I actually okay. wrote a sidebar in America's Civil War back in May of this year. Um, oh wow. I discussed, okay. it, I discussed that very thing. 
Uh, and the bottom line is, let's assume Ehrlich's entire division goes into Lancaster like he wants to. Right. It doesn't say, that doesn't change anyone else's movements. Everyone else is still going to concentrate at Heidelberg. They're still going to concentrate at Cash Town. Early's not going to be there. So, right. you know, Early's going to be hot rushing back across the bridge. He's never going to be there on July 1st. And so there is no attack on Barlow's Knoll by Early's division. None of that stuff happens. And Lord knows, you know, there's another great what if. Uh, if that bridge didn't burn, uh, Early's not there. Uh, so much like Stewart for sure isn't there. And Eric wisely brought up what if Stewart was there. The antithesis of that is what if Early wasn't there? Yeah. Eric, and, you want to add anything? I, you, you summed it up quite nicely. I don't have anything to add mm -hmm. to that. I will say this. I think that his had he gotten across the river and tried to advance on Harrisburg from the south, as he had stated his intention was, that's a lot of cross-country marching. And mm -hmm. it's hard to, to say whether they would have gotten there in time to do anything coordinated with the other two divisions. And the likelihood is they would have got, had they gotten there with the other two, vision, two, two divisions already gone, what do they accomplish? Not much. Yeah, right. Exactly. Right. I mean, the worst case scenario is early gets cut off. Exactly. Uh, yeah, and the whole division know. gets captured. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Well, that's, that's great because it's exactly what I've been thinking for the last, I don't know, few years uh, that I've been pondering that question, but I need to check out your article, Scott. That sounds great. Thanks. Yeah. It gets yeah. the May issue of America's civil war. Okay. Yeah, John Gutman and I co-wrote an article on Gordon and the attack on the bridge. All right. Um, well, I do not see any additional uh, questions at this time. Thank uh, you for having us, Adam. Oh, we yes. appreciate it. Uh, and again, if people... anyone's interested, the book is called If We're Striking for Pennsylvania. It's available from Savas Beatty, of course, uh, numerous other sources. Eric has a website. You can get autographed copies directly from Eric. Of course, you can get them from me as well in my uh, many York County appearances. Uh, but in volume two is coming out. Yeah, and we Eric got, and I just got the galley proof. We got the final galleys this afternoon. Today, yeah. And you expect that's going to be available in the spring? Yes. Mm -hmm. That's okay. all. Mm -hmm. Excellent. All right. Uh, well. At that point, at this point, I'm going to say uh, thank you very much. We really appreciated tonight's presentation. And uh, I'll let you both go. And thank you for everybody uh, who attended tonight. I think our next meeting is, just checking here on my calendar, is February 15th, uh, which seems early, but you know, it's, that's it's right around yeah. the corner. It's yeah, the it's, the third, yeah. it's the third Wednesday. Okay, mm -hmm. thank you so much. Um, thank you. And have a great evening. Thanks, Eric. Thanks, bye, bye, Scott. guys. Bye. Good night.